Welcome to Discerning the Forums podcast. I'm Nick, and I'm here with Charles Howell. How are you, Charles? I'm doing well. It's um, you can start to see the change of seasons here in Scotland. There's there's wow. eight hours of daylight now instead of six as it was a few weeks ago. So everything's looking more optimistic these days. Oh, good. And in a court, and you're in St. Andrews, correct? Yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's great. Now we've had you on before to talk about aesthetics and, uh, I have to say it was one of, it's one of our most downloaded episodes. So, um, it's definitely was an exciting, it was definitely an exciting topic to discuss. And, um, so I wanted to get you back on, uh, to talk about, um, and I'm going to, maybe botch his name because what he's German. So, and I'm not, and I, I can't do the German stuff, but uh, you can help me with that, but it's ever, ever hard. <laughs> How do you say that? Youngle. Yeah. Ever hard Youngle. Yeah. Okay. So I, I was close. So um, now this is a, a theologian who I'm not sure how much our, our listener base might have heard of him i dug up i have this pile of books you know that i want to read someday and and i do i think i'm guessing that you recommended this to me one one conversation or two ago um does this look familiar god as the mystery of the world yeah let me show you my version you have one too oh yeah we're brothers. That's... All right. Yeah. It's in now, but you have yours marked up. I don't. So I'm going to ask you questions today because uh, I'm interested in Yungle. He, you know, he's been in, uh, he's a very influential theo- theologian. And, you know, he, the topics he delves into is, goes everywhere from like hermeneutics and you know he was right in there uh studying boltmann and heidegger and all that kind of stuff modern theology but he has an interesting twist and take on it and so i wanted to pick your brain and and just have you tell our audience what is so interesting about him but before we do that um trying to pull pull our conversation up i have this new tech that is not as familiar with me. So um, just maybe you can introduce Jungle to us, maybe some about his life, because you mentioned earlier in our discussion and in, in a paper you wrote that uh, his early life is important to his theology. And that's much the case for a lot of philosophers, a lot of theologians, that how they grew up, where they were, matters and so i want to take that seriously what is uh interesting about Jungle's life yeah i think to start answering that question we'll do a little bit of a, a retrospective um from his developed theology and that he makes okay. the point that theology can only be done from your particular place in history and okay. this is a consequence of um god's revelation of jesus in history and it gives a an importance to the particularities of history so god can't talk be be talked about or discussed abstractly only historically Mm. and and that means he can only be discussed from a historical place um Mm. so so it it's in his life becomes important for his theology in that sense in that what he discusses theologically is from his own context and it's what we'll get i guess maybe further in the conversation we get into this deeper but it's because the question of meaning of importance is raised by your historical context so okay you have to answer the question that your place and time gives you as it re- as it references or relates to god Interesting. So, so history, almost, you know, historicism, that's a big word. Is he, does he bring that in a little bit? Is he, he's probably a critic, maybe a little, but anyways, 
history matters, it's probably the revert. The it's more concrete uh, history in your moment that that matters. Yeah, it, it's that. Um, as an individual, you can't speak, but as an individual. Okay. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah, this is very Kierkegaardian to me, right? Yeah. Yeah. Truth okay. is subjectivity. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So that was, that's kind of his, uh, maybe something about his theology that's interesting. Okay. So what is it then about his life that is, uh, shaped his theology? Yeah. And I, and I think that, you know, I would say there's two important moments, um, mm -hmm. that adds to his theology, the way he sees it. He was born in the thirties in Germany right before World War II, during the rise of National Socialism. And he recalls um, during the bombing of, of Berlin by the Allied forces, as he was seven or eight at the time, um, being in a bomb shelter with, the, I guess, the whole neighborhood had a bomb shelter that they would get into. And, he's, and even though he wasn't in an overtly religious family, he says that his mother started to pray as the bobs were raining down and they were in this bomb shelter and her prayer was so powerful that it not only silenced the chaos that was going on in the room, it caused others who weren't explicitly re religious to join in. And he says that at that moment in this crisis, he saw the power of piety. Mm -hmm. he, he saw the, um, that there was something more powerful than the bombs dropping being um, interrupted into the world. And so um, the question of piety in some sense becomes, stays important with Jungle. Theological discussions are, discussions are not just about God, they're about how God affects the human person. And this is this goes back to what we just said: truth is subjectivity. So the truth of God is not just discussed; it's felt. It's felt. It's experienced. That's really interesting for me. Is kind of having this kind of Pentecostal background <laughs> because I, um, you can almost kind of see that 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 experiential, well, Pietism, as you say. But yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. And then I think the other big event that shapes his life is after World War II, he moves to East Berlin and uh, spends his teenage years and his, his early professional career um, under the DDR, under Soviet occupation of East Berlin. And all the things that this brings up theologically, the political turmoil, and maybe most important, the question of atheism. Um, a lot of his work and, and his main work, the, the God is the mystery of the world that you mentioned earlier, is a response to Soviet style atheism. It's the question of what does this type of atheism have to do with theology? How do we make sense of God in a in a political regime that's um, making it illegal to even meet, use the word God? Hmm. Interesting. So now I think this is going to be uh, an important conversation for for our listeners because he seems to then cross cross the board of anything that would interest you theologically, whether you're atheist or not. But this is uh, interesting to me because of. I don't know. I guess the times we're in, so to speak. So he 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 has a lot of cultural significance to an application in our time. Correct. Yeah, I think in some sense. You think? I think um, there's there's a danger in in kind of equivocating on what he his context and ours. And, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's always yeah. a danger when you compare these things. I um, wanted to do that right away when I was thinking, yeah. you know. But we're not in World War II. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, there, there are definitely They're principles different. or stuff that you can draw out of there. But the atheism he was dealing with is a little bit different than, than the atheism we have in America yeah. or the conversations in, in the West, which is it's a choice whether you believe in God or not. There, okay. it wasn't a choice. And, and the way this mm -hmm. shapes, let me give just another um, aspect is – 
in the education system in East Berlin, you were dictated what you could say. It was speech and thought were governed. And the only place that had um, exceptions was the church. So there would be philosophical and theological conversations taking place in a church that couldn't take place in um, school. Oh, and interesting. It's almost he, the reverse, it seems like, in our culture, sadly. It, well, in some ways, yeah. And he says <laughs> that that even though he knew the phrase, the truth will set you free, long before mm -hmm. he read the Bible, it was in those conversations in the church that he experienced it. That's when he mm -hmm. saw what it means for the truth to set you free. And it's the mm -hmm. unfettered um, investigation of the mind as it questions the great questions of as it tries to answer the great, great questions of life, of reality, of living in this world. And mm -hmm. to him, God is the the greatest of those questions. OK, interesting. So who are his conversation partners? Who is he talking to and learning from? Um, so it's he's in the the kind of group of um, German theologians that come right after Bart and Boltman and Rahner and okay. Heidegger mm -hmm. and that whole generation. So since mm -hmm. he got his his doctorate in the late fifties, early sixties, um, so he's a contemporary with with Moltmann would probably be the closest. Um, Colin Gunton. Um, okay. And that they're all contemporaries as they all studied under Bart and and Heidegger and these guys. Okay, so Heidegger is a conversation partner then, and then early existentialism, um, Kierkegaard. Uh, okay, so tell me about what is uh, what is it that you know is is he's being influenced by these these people having these conversations? How does how does he take unique uh, a unique perspective in the those circles? Yeah, and maybe might um, be a big question. Yeah, maybe we'll answer it by just going through his education. That might be the yeah. The, okay, do that. The easiest way to, to answer it, the most organized way. Um, so he in um when he went to university, he he met a couple professors that had either direct or indirect influence on the way he thought. One was Ernst Fuchs, who's probably the most important person. Um, to that influences his thought, the, the way it develops. And Ernst Fuchs was part of this group, this movement called the New Hermeneutic, where they were taking mm -hmm. the ontological discussions going on with Heidegger and Wittgenstein and in some sense Boltman and um, develop, developing it into a theological discussion based on the word of God. So the kind of base assumptions for them is that ontologically, we're not beings of substance. We're beings of relationality. And in that we relate, we communicate with one another. So language becomes a constitutive feature of existence. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible, you know, Genesis says, in the beginning was the word, they take that to mean language itself. Language was there before being was, before substance was. Mm -hmm. And that we're formed by our linguistic conversations. So what Fuchs and the other big um, guy with New Hermeneutic is Gerhard Ebling. Um, mm -hmm. What they did was they developed a reading of the New Testament based on that ontological assumption. So the events around Jesus, both in his life, death, resurrection, and then the reflection that comes afterwards in the epistles, are interruptions where the original creative word of God is reconstituting reality uh, interesting <clears throat> so it's a very you know create it's not like god is this fixed uh, be careful here um language <laughs> but that that there's there's a lot of creativity going on in the the way that um god is well i be careful there, but from our perspective, there's a, there's more new, there's God's breaking into the world talking and that creates new, new moments. Yeah. Um, 
and this will you know you're you're careful to walk on eggshells when it comes to the theological claims and we'll deal with those i guess a little bit later because i don't want to make any claims i just want to know yeah <laughs> yeah so so Jung says ontologically we are beings of possibility and not actuality mm, so we are always in um we are always in the face of the horizon of possibility and in that horizon we're waiting for god to come to the world and interrupt it and in mm -hmm. his interruptions the world is reconstituted so it can't be okay. a, 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 a stable world of actual events it's always a unstable world of possibilities okay interesting okay so they're very very significant so <clears throat> okay so what was it he disagreed with with um how do you say his name uh food i i don't want to say his name yeah fuchs, <laughs> and fuchs. fuchs so so fuchs he pretty much agrees with everything that fuchs says he pushes it further uh -huh. is, is what he, he's, okay. he takes what fuchs and evelyn are doing and fuchs and evelyn were both students um or we're more colleagues with Boltman. So oh, I see. Um, he takes what that group is doing and pushes it further. But the other influence from his university years, uh, the first influence would be um, Vogel, Heinrich Vogel, who was one of Bart's colleagues. He worked in the Confessing Church. Um, he was with mm -hmm. Bart in uh, during when Bart was writing the Church Dogmatics. Um, mm -hmm. And Vogel is... Um, pretty much a, a, as typical as you could be of a dialectical theologian, which isn't meant to be a criticism. It's, it's, um, he, he he's took working a, early an with aspect Art. of what was going on. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And that, and he just continued working on that the rest of his life. And this, mm -hmm. uh, young goal experiences Kierkegaard through Vogel and he ends up rejecting Vogel because he doesn't think dialectical theology can do what, everything we need it to do. Um, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't want God to remain a dialectic between being and non-being. Yeah. Um, okay. Because, because as we'll, we'll get to the death of Jesus for young girl is finitude of divinity. So God participates mm -hmm. in non-being. So he isn't just dialectically opposed to it. Um, Interesting. but the, so he was influenced by the conversations he had. And, and let me, one more point on Fuchs that's important is their relationship which which eventually stayed close until Hughes passing um was an initially uh argumentative they they didn't agree on a whole lot young thought that Fuchs dismissal of um heideggerian ontology was was too rash so Fuchs challenged young to write a paper comparing the concepts of ontic and ontological that's um ontic is kind of the world world beings of uh, you know uh me and you as human beings and then ontological is the the notion of being itself that lies behind the ontic yeah um, and after he wrote that paper fuchs saw i guess the the genius the possibility in Jungle, and they became really close mm, okay. so okay yeah, the, the influence of those early years came somewhat by their teaching, but more by the context they had. So in the mm -hmm. late 50s, um, Jungle got a scholarship and was able to afford some time to study abroad. And this is this is a whole interesting story in his his real world context because he's in the DDR. So he can't just leave and go study. He wanted to study under Bart and Heidegger um, mm -hmm. who were in and um bart was in basel basel switzerland um mm -hmm. heidegger is it marburg i think is where heidegger was mm -hmm. so young girl had to come up with a plan to escape east berlin to go spend a legal semester as it's been called abroad <laughs> and he manages to figure out a way that he can buy train tickets and lie about what stop he's getting off so, so he can end up in west germany where he wants to um but in order the the big issue with his leaving is how to explain his absence for oh, a semester of longer and so he he spreads a rumor that he um has a had a mental breakdown and had to be committed to some asylum that was 
up in northern Germany. And he says that um, when he got back, he heard that people's response to that rumor was that they saw it coming because he spent too much time thinking about theology. <laughs> so, so they Man, this should be a it. movie. Yeah. <laughs> so, so through Fuchs, Fuchs um, lined up Youngville to stay with Gerhard Ebling, which is the other new hermeneutic. He would stay with Ebling. This is where he um, learned Lutheran theology. And he attended, who was at the same place as, um, or near where Heidegger was lecturing. He was, Heidegger was lecturing um, the, the series that, that came to be published into Vegas or Sprache or um, on the way to language. So this is the later Heidegger, 58 is the year, linguistic term. Mm -hmm. He stayed with Ebling, would attend lectures with Heidegger, and then once a month go down to see Bart and attend Bart's seminar. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so in, 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 in one semester, he developed these relationships that lasted forever. I mean, lasted through you know, the end of their lives. And he, Bart took such a liking for him, to him, that um, he offered Jungle to stay and do his, his dissertation under Bart. But the politics demanded that Jungle return to East Berlin. Mm -hmm. And when he got back to East Berlin to his apartment, Bart had sent um, a complete set of the dogmatics that had just been published up to that point, which was it, the fourth uh, volume hadn't been written yet. And oh, with, interesting. A note, with a note um, about, you know, an encouraging note to Jungle to continue his theological training. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So when we're talking about influences, we have to throw so Fuchs and Evelyn, but then Heidegger, Boltman, Luther mm -hmm. that he gets through Evelyn and, mm -hmm. um, and Kierkegaard, Bart. yeah, Bart, yeah, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> you all, and, and then Bart being just such a significant uh, influence on his life. I mean, not that the others aren't, but um, that's important too. Um, so. Okay, so then, then let's kind of dig in a little bit into his theology. Um, what is what is he bringing to the table as he's being influenced by you know Bart and Heidegger and 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 these contemporaries of his? Um, the the beginning of that, you know, this is another complicated question. Everything everything with Jungle isn't. There's nothing simple in there. Nothing simple. Um, the first thing is his hermeneutical approach. And I think this okay. is foundational. And he gets this from Fuchs, from the linguistic term. Um, for him, language constitutes reality. So mm -hmm. nothing else can be said until you deal with what language is and what meaning is in relation to language. Mm -hmm. um, and in, in this, he does pretty innovative work with metaphor he has a, he has an article and maybe this is his best known work because it's it it's um cited in literary criticism and all types of fields outside of theology um it's an article titled uh, metaphorical truth where he essentially says that theology is in a in a kind of predicament with its language in in that it has to speak both to reality as in the actual states of affairs as well as beyond reality towards the eschatology of the world. Mm. And it has to do it simultaneously. And okay. Young Goam says that metaphor is the, is the way it's done biblically, the way it's been done historically, and the only way that it it's can be done in after the linguistic turn. So he was one of the first, and he published this alongside Paul Ricoeur when Ricoeur's in, in the same volume that Ricoeur's working on his stuff on metaphor. Um, he, he really brought uh, metaphor to a, um, a useful category when talking about theological language. Oh, interesting. So um, I guess with that um, here, how does he deal with then um 
issues related to this maybe just a side note side thing that's interesting to me how does he deal with issues related to um like typology and so forth um as it and and the meaning of these new events that break into to history does that make sense um yeah uh, so he's if by typology do you mean like hans fry and and narrative mm -hmm. theology yeah the way the narrative goes yeah yeah absolutely yeah. Mm -hmm. so narrative for him is one of the the um most appropriate types of metaphor mm -hmm. and it's because uh so it, it's due to the foundational foundational type of metaphor for young is the address is the, the language of address and in in the address so when someone addresses you when someone says hey you you're immediately called to attention it's almost that you don't even have a, a chance to ignore it oh interesting someone says so, your name charles yeah yeah you, um, you perk up so when when we tie this into linguistic ontology and theology when god creates the world through the word it's an address he addresses creation and in that address of creation presents uh, a crisis to creation um, between being and nothingness and chooses oh, being and that's what creation is and this happens again on the cross god addresses the the situation of life and death in christ and in addressing it presents a crisis and chooses life and it will oh, happen it will happen again in eschatology where it's between this world and the new world mm. so in the address okay. but but in god's address this is how it ties to narrative in god's mm -hmm. address that's where we get presence from and presence is um temporal and spatial so spatially it's it's what's in front of you it's what what is present to you it's it's what's standing in front of you demanding your attention Mm -hmm. um, temporally it's what separates the past from the future it's the present moment mm -hmm. so in god's address all the world is reoriented to his presence mm -hmm. so and that affects what, time mm -hmm. yeah so then narrative is the type of metaphor maybe figurative language is um a better term than metaphor even though they're they mean the same thing in this situation um narrative is the, the kind of figurative language that can capture what's going on in time when God addresses and makes the present present. Oh, I see so much with like Bart and his preaching too there, <laughs> like this, this moment of address um, in the spatial and temporal relationships there. Um something else i was going to say and then it escapes me but um the so what's so interesting here with uh what you're doing this this is unlocked so much for me but um drawing out those things you can see where there's a little bit of this existentialism in the background the neil is the threat of nihilism is is there with god's calling us out of that is there am, am i on to something <laughs> like is he is he doing anything with that is there anything interesting going on there with this kind of instead of a nihilistic turn there's a that seems to always be present with even the creation some summoning and there's the would you say the tension or the threat of non-existence or something like that um um is there a dialectical thing going on there? Um, yeah, so it's it's more complicated than dialectic, and this goes back to Vogel. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't want. Really he wants to go beyond it. Mm -hmm. He wants to go beyond dialectical thinking, mm -hmm. and and um, I don't want to get too ahead of the conversation. Okay, so. sure. <laughs> 
So, so the way he does it is through an influ- a conversation with Hegel. So we'll have to eventually mm-hmm. draw Hegel into this, but I'm not sure if this is the place sure. to do it. Yeah, well, there's a few more foundational things before we get there. Okay, keep keep ticking away at those, and and we'll we'll get back to that that question. Yeah. So um, bringing up Bart and the similarities between Bart, um, mm-hmm. the similarity is their reliance on Revelation, and and in some mm-hmm. ways, the di- the big difference between Bart and Jungel is that where Bart is speaking of Revelation as the historical Jesus, but um, kind of broadly as the historical Jesus, you know, he's trying to establish where we can get um, an experience with God. Jungel says, okay, Bart's done that. Let's talk about the specific features of that historical experience. And one of Jungle's earlier um, publications, uh, Gottes Sein ist in Verden, which has been published, it's under a few, I mean, translated in English under a few titles. The the best one is God's Being is in Becoming. Um, I just want to double check. Uh, I think Webster, John Webster did the translation. Yeah. Webster did the translation of this. Um, It's, an interpretation of Bart's divine ontology, his doctrine of election. But he begins, Jungle begins that book discussing a debate that's going on with like the the two students of Boltman and Bart, um, Herbert Braun and Helmut Gullfitzer. Braun, coming from Boltman's side, says that we know God in his will for us and what he wills. So This is um, maybe easily understood when we say, what is the meaning of the cross? And it's we say it's for salvation, right? So the cross isn't about God. It's about what God is doing, which is salvation. Hmm. Um, Against that, Goldwitzer says, well, you're not talking about God if you say that. You might be talking about what God is doing, but you're not talking about who God is. And we need to get to looking at the cross to see who God is. And Goldwitzer sets up a dialectical theology then, and Jungle says, well, this, in in Goldwitzer's dialectical theology, the death of the cross is overcoming the resurrection. And Jungle says, it's too quick of a step. Like, you're you're going too quickly. You essentially um, ignore the cross in light of the resurrection instead of focusing on the cross and seeing what theological experience can happen in the cross. So taking Bart's doctrine of revelation, he, he focuses in on this one moment when Jesus dies on the cross and says, what does that tell us about God? So, and I think this is, so his doctrine of revelation, it's the address of God. It's all, you know, language is behind all this but language Mm -hmm. doesn't ignore the historical reality and Mm -hmm. also the narrative doesn't override the historical reality where you can't just place the cross in the narrative and say well the meaning is about the resurrection the meaning is about the cross and we have to focus on this this also shows his lutheran influence yeah theology of the crucified god okay so then does this lead in to his ontology or um is there a couple more things to get to before that with revelation now i think that um it's it's tied we we get tied to his ontology all these things float around in young around this nexus so they all go in and out of each other it's hard to separate doctrine of revelation from ontology from trinity from hermeneutics and from faith and justification which is the correspondence yeah, you have to keep of the doing the same thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So if everything goes back to his revelation, his doctrine of revelation, which follows Bart, but focuses um, specifically on the death of Jesus, um, the ontology flows through that. And I think first it's probably appropriate to discuss divine ontology before, before, mm-hmm. before we get to worldly ontology. Okay. Let's do um, that. Yeah. So in revelation, it isn't that God explains what he wants to happen, so salvation or something. It isn't um, revelation in a sense of just knowledge about God. 
It's an experience of God himself, of God's being. So he follows Rahner in this point, and there's no distinction between the imminent and economic trinity. Um, everything is collapsed. Mm -hmm. God on the cross is God. There mm -hmm. isn't a hidden God behind the cross. It's God. Um, but that doesn't mean that God is just Jesus either. Right. The way that Jungle explains this is that God's being is an event. In this event, he uses becoming in some writings and coming in the other ones, um, which to me signals that he's trying to figure out the appropriate language to use. Mm -hmm. So let's stick with becoming. God's being is an event of becoming. Now, mm -hmm. he doesn't mean by becoming process theology. Okay. This will yeah. be important. So the historical particularities of the world do not change God. They mm -hmm. are constituted by God's address. So the world is only as it is because God has addressed the world in such a manner that it becomes that. Or the world oh, is in possibility, not actuality. Mm -hmm. um, becoming really signifies that God can't be understood by a metaphysics of substance. That the event mm -hmm. of God is um, a relation in God. And this is his Trinitarian work. So along with Bart's doctrine of revelation, he also um, picks up Bart's doctrine of election. Um, okay. So Bart's in doctrine Christ. of election yeah. isn't that God chooses who's saved or not. It's that mm -hmm. God chooses who God is is that God determines his own existence and essence. That's the, the election of God. And in determining who God is, in God's self-determination, he determines to be for the world, to be historical, and to experience death. And that's, that's where Jungle pushes beyond Bart. So um, now it comes, how do you make sense out of that God's existence is death? Yeah. And what Jungle does is, is use the word, the, the concept of coming at this point. And in a Trinitarian mode, he says God comes from himself to himself as himself. And what he means mm. there can, is roughly mapped out um, the Father to the Son as the Spirit. Mm -hmm. But in God, as God comes from the Father to the Son, it's the dialectic of God coming from being to nothingness, God coming from life to death. In terms of love, God coming from a self-possession um, to a self-forsakenness for the sake of the other. Hmm. But when God makes that movement from himself to himself, he finds himself. So when God, for instance, moves from eternal life to the death of a cross, he finds himself on the cross in the death. So he, in a sense, returns to himself as he's leaving himself. And in finding himself, he finds a surplus of his being. He finds himself in a new way. Hmm. And that surplus that happens in this event um, is the excess of God. It's, it's the overabundance of God. It's, it's what in a metaphysical system would be, you know, the, the infinite qualitative distinction of God. Hmm. Interesting. So how, now this, um, our last episode was on divine simplicity and, uh, we kind of tried to deal with some of the issues there. Um, how does I, this might come out of left field, but it was our last episode. Uh, how does that relate to, um, how you, how you might talk about God in this way. Yeah. So, um, simplicity, if it, if it means the metaphysical, uh, collapse of substances, you mm -hmm. can't apply that to Jungle. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it, it'd be more of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, the, the way he says it is it's simplicity. Um, involves the inexhaustible number of God's relations. Mm -hmm. And he um, uses the metaphor mm -hmm. of fire. So uh, that one fire has an innumerable uh, amount of flames in it. 
So the flames are the different types of way that God comes from himself to himself manifest. as himself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't know if manifest is the right word um, mm -hmm. because there was never a time when God wasn't doing this e event, yeah, this whole exactly. process. It isn't a temporal thing. It happens at once. All of it happens at once and it happens eternally at once. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. But, but since, so, since Youngle's ontology is relational, not substance, mm -hmm. um, it, it, God only is in his relations. Mm -hmm. So you can never point to, to a, a substantial thing and say, that's God. You can only point mm -hmm. to the event taking place within his relations, and that's God. Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, the, okay. and, and the event that defines God is love for Youngle. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Um. Uh, okay, so any anything else you would want to say about that ontology of God becoming Himself? <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to wrap my head the... around it. <laughs> <laughs> at one at one point, he uses the phrase um, "becoming" is the manner in which God is. It's the place of okay. His ontology, mm -hmm. and which is a Heideggerian term, and it shows up in the secondary literature on Jungle that that phrase, "the place of His ontology." But no one ever mm -hmm. explains what in the world he's talking about, so it's <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> um, I would say that that if if we keep in mind that everything theologically said about God comes from revelation, mm -hmm. you have to have Jesus, the, the image of Jesus on the cross in your head whenever Jungle says mm -hmm. anything, because he never says anything that isn't available in that moment. Interesting. Um, so that's why it's death almost has icon. To, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Death has to be part of who God is because in that moment, God died. It can't be relegated to just the humanity of Jesus, which is what tip is typically done, right? It isn't God. It's as, as in a Trinitarian manner, it's Jesus. Um, but it isn't even Jesus' divinity that dies. It's Jesus' humanity that dies. Youngle says, why are you dividing God like multiple times to explain this? God is on the cross. Um, mm -hmm. ah, there was another point, ontology. But also it shows um, in that God addresses the world at the cross. It, it reveals our ontology as well the world's ontology so the world and and god are still they're two distinct radically unique god is radically unique to the world um it's protestant kind of based in that sense as god comes to the world and addresses the world it shows that the world is fundamentally linguistic that it finds itself in, in a relation to to god so it's fundamentally relational and that it's always open to possibility. In this mm -hmm. case, the possibility to become a different world. Mm -hmm. um, and that plays out in the world in general, but then also in anthropology, in the individual person. Mm -hmm. That we find that we're addressable, that we need relations to understand ourselves, to know ourselves, and that mm -hmm. um, in these interruptive events that come by way of address from these other relations, we realize that we're not as in control as we think we are. That we're actually just um, waiting to be interrupted, waiting for the next possibility of interruption. And in those interruptions, we're ontologically transformed. So you mentioned earlier in the discussion on ontology, you, you had this Trinitarian Youngolian, how would you say, uh, slogan of the becoming, the triad becoming thing. Uh, what? Okay, so I know the Trinity is huge for Bart and in modern theology. How does Youngol interact with this? How does this work out in in his theology and ontology? Yeah, um, I think it's notable that Youngol was working on the Trinity in the '60s. He, he actually recounts that Moltmann came and visited to him when he was writing his book on Bart's Doctrine of the Trinity. And Moltmann says, why are you wasting your time on the Trinity? 
<laughs> which is, you know, wow. <laughs> pretty amusing thinking about who Bolton thinking actually, Bolton. I mean, what he's known <laughs> for. Yeah. But the, so the Trinitarian could we say term, that, yeah, could we say that Moltman was uh, uh, secretly influenced by Young Bull? I don't know. Well, I, you know, the Trinitarian turn takes place in the 80s, and Moltman, in the beginning of his trilogy, discusses the event that makes him start thinking of that, which is hope, um, oh. which is a key mm -hmm. theme in Young Bull, too. So maybe they were, they were definitely in conversation <laughs> their entire lives. Um, mm -hmm. um, as for the influence, the major, main influence that Jung has had on Trinitarian theology is his interpretation of Bart's Trinity, which is where Dave McCormick gets his interpretation. Um, you know, technically, uh, the, te the technicalities of it are that uh, logically election precedes Trinity. So God's mm. decision comes before his Trinitarian nature. Um, okay. That's McCormick's kind of position. And there's no logos of sarcos. Um, there's no uh, logos before Christ, right? Mm -hmm. um, these are all debates that goes goes that are going on in Trinitarian discussions. Oh, um, yeah, and, and McCormack okay. cites Jungel as his source for those. It, that's the book that awoken him to that reading of Bart. Mm. So really, his influence probably comes from that, from an interpretation of Bart among on. Um, um, yeah, and I guess that's his main influence. The uniqueness of it, though, is how death plays in to the Trinity. And uh, maybe we can bring Hegel in here. Sure. Um, Why not? <laughs> yeah, you know, we're already confused enough. Let's, bring in Let's throw another. Hegel into the mix. <laughs> So um, Hegel, right? Yeah, Jungle <laughs> says so. When when Jungle says we need to focus on the death of God, mm -hmm. and just another callback um, that this comes from trying to deal with atheism. Okay, and this very important. Okay, yeah. Um, Jungle says there's only two people that have really focused on the death of God, and that's Luther. Can, and can I Hegel. stop you just for a second? Yeah, this is just a question in my mind. Does Nietzsche play in any of this? Yeah. Um, okay. Nietzsche become is, is a critical partner. Is he a foil? Jungle's. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jungle. Sorry, go ahead. Um, uh, just a quick biographical note on Jungle. Jungle has essentially memorized the entire German intellectual tradition. He he was raised in a in a, a type of education where that's what you did. So you would you wouldn't just read Nietzsche, you would memorize Nietzsche. What? Wow. Yes. Yeah, so so when when you're working through Jungle, he drops names from the last 400 years of of continental philosophy, the continental thought, um, mm -hmm. like you're supposed to know what the ins and outs of all these systems. <laughs> so it's like a biblical <laughs> reference. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. <laughs> um, wow. So so with Hegel. Okay. Um, Hegel's, you know, his most known for the, the dialectic, where the particularities of history are are becoming expressed as a universal or absolute spirit that is working towards a teleology where the particulars dissolve into the absolute. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that isn't exactly what Jungle's doing because, like we've already said, it's not process. So particularities of history don't add to. The absolute. It's the other way yeah. around with the absolute, if you will. Jungel doesn't like the word absolute for God, so we got to be careful. He would say sure. more than absolute, probably, um, mm -hmm. where God determines the particularities of history. And one way to think about this is that the distinctions that normally take place in theology between either the world and God or Jesus's humanity and Jesus's divinity take place in God with Jungel. So um, time isn't something outside of God, time versus eternality. It's a distinction that takes place in God. Mm -hmm. In God's coming from himself, he goes from timelessness into time and resolves the tension between the two in that process. Okay. Okay. Um, mm. And this is how death plays in. In God's coming from himself to himself, he moves from life to death and resolves the tension between life and death. 
Hmm. Very, very canonic um, view of God. It, but d- he differs maybe a little. He d- Like you said, he's not process. He's not, God's not emptying himself to become, or is he? Is he emptying himself to become kind of cre- creaturely? <laughs> I don't know how to say it. No, I think that the younger would say that that thinks of God as a substance. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, interesting. That, in the relations is the emptying, but it, it comes in the relation between God and God yeah. and not in the substance of who God is. Okay. Okay, good. Interesting. Okay. So we were talking about Trinity. So that that basically, um, how does the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Spirit relate to each other in this? Yeah, this it's way. it's somewhat Augustinian. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, yeah. Young will, so... Maybe another note might help here. Mm-hmm. The the kind of process of the new hermeneutic of Fuchs and Evelyn mm-hmm. isn't to say everything was wrong before. It's to go back and look at um, what people have said in the past and show the hidden assumptions and how they relate to, to contemporary questions. So okay. Jungle isn't is it just saying metaphysics had it wrong the whole time? He's saying that there were hidden assumptions in metaphysical systems that mm-hmm. um were brought to light in modern thought ultimately in okay. nietzsche in the death of god and this is kind of his whole process is, is he says we're worried about atheism when mm-hmm. god dying They're is one of the most deal. theological proclamations you could ever make like yeah. what are we worried about with people saying that god is dead we should be rejoicing yeah, yeah. um so, so he, we're he not going to sing that newsboy song what was it yeah there? God's not dead, he's surely alive. Dead, he's surely alive, yeah. <laughs> Youngo says God's definitely dead. God's dead. <laughs> he died. But in death you yeah. find life. He conquered, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, so at, he relates the uh, Father to the Son as the Spirit. The Spirit is, is somewhat the, the love connection between God and the Son. His big mm-hmm. difference, though, is, um, you know, maybe, maybe this appears in Aquinas as, as uh, the similarities between God, it, it stressed that that uh, Father, Son, Spirit, in their um, activity, shows how close they are to one another. Jungle mm-hmm. would stress the dissimilarity. So he okay. says, in that God goes from the Father to the Son as the Spirit. That from shows this negative element in the trinity and this is this is where hegel comes in it's that negative she's emphasizing the is not yeah the is not part of it yeah Mm -hmm. but but the way he says it you know so it isn't just negative and it isn't dialectical it's it's Mm -hmm. um it's a a great similarity god is a great similarity with an even greater dissimilarity for the sake of an even greater similarity oh wow Okay. Yeah, so so God's the similarity of God that happens mm-hmm. in this interrelational trinitarian event is the dissimilarity, but in that dissimilarity God finds the greater similarity, right? God finds his similarity in excess, in a surplus. Mm-hmm. So he returns to himself in a sense more than he was when he left himself. But remember mm-hmm. this isn't temporal, so it it's happens. not substance. Yeah. It's right. not substance, yeah. Yeah. Okay, wow. So you know, almost in a way, this can tie back into Revelation in the sense that uh, we're seeing God as way more than we ever imagined before. Is that maybe something that that we could take home? <laughs> yeah, but it's, but it's not just imagination. <laughs> this isn't, you know, when God addresses, yeah. it's not. Okay, sure. It's not r- rational. It's ex- existential. So yeah. we experience oh, wow. God as ever more. We experience God as mm. that which is beyond experience. Mm. Okay. But in in the experience is all of God. And that's the only way we get that he's more than that experience because we're experiencing that surplus. The event. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Wow. Okay. So now you meant you, uh, I guess the other thing too, and he, he's a Lutheran theologian. So. Um, you know, I have to think, uh, 
if he's dealt with Luther and he's in, in those circles, that he has a take on justification and the doctrine of justification. Uh, first of all, what was going on in that theological world with justification and then in modern theology and then what his take is on it? Um, big question, but maybe you could unpack it better than I could. <laughs> Yeah, um, so in the 90s, there's um, an ecumenical conversation going mm-hmm. on. L- between, between Lutherans and Roman Catholics, right? Yeah, yeah, Lutherans and Roman Catholics, and they come up with this thing called the Joint Declaration of Doctrine and Justification, where it's supposed to be, mm-hmm. we can agree on this. And Youngville yeah. reads that and says, you're out of your mind. And he says, <laughs> like, it's, it's great that we're doing this ecumenical stuff, uh, you just conceded every Protestant position in that declaration. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and Jungle's big thing, it's it's um, it's that justification happens in the address of God, and it mm-hmm. comes by way of an ontological interruption. So, mm-hmm. what justification is for for Jungle is not. Uh, declaration of righteousness it's not legal terms at all it's ontological yeah. terms oh interesting when you're addressed by god when you meet god in that experience of his address your being is interrupted and you become ontologically a new type of being mm-hmm. and in that new type of being you find faith or it's defined by faith um, mm-hmm. you become the subject of faith is what he would say okay so it I can see where that would parallel with even contemporary discussions on Paul. Yeah. Because it seems like his theology is you are this now, therefore live this way. Um, <clears throat> implying that ontological status. Um, am I reading that? Yeah. Faith is Sim- being you know? in Christ, but in Christ yeah. is for young mm-hmm. ontological. It's, it's being. Yeah in a new relationship based on our relational yes. ontology to the word of God okay. based on the linguistic aspect of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. And I can see where that fits in his broader theology of that address that, that brings forth the, the new, could I say new world, a new world, not just for you, but <laughs> um, new substances. <laughs> no, no, new relations. New we're, relations. We're relations. relations. We're relations. Relations. Yeah. That's so. That's so important because yeah. because his relational ontology is is seems to be at at the core of this, right? Yeah, and it isn't. So some relational ontologies they they mm-hmm. are relations between substances. So yes, okay. Yeah, this is Jungle relations. All Get that out of our head. Yeah. Okay. So, mm-hmm. so if we think about, there's three main features of relational ontology. It's it's God, the world, and the human person. Mm-hmm. God is a set of relations. So okay. there's no substance there. Um, the human person is a relation between what he calls the self and the ego. So this is a kind of a Kantian transcendental relation. Oh, and I, okay. We only are what we understand ourselves to be what we interpret ourselves to be are you going to throw freud in there uh well, we already for, <laughs> we already talked about hegel so no, i'm joking <laughs> yeah freud's in there but we're, we're going to leave out <laughs> we have to limit this i mean we have to get yeah. to schiller and Schelling and ficta probably before we get to for, freud for freud okay. young girl. <laughs> um, I mean, he memorized all those guys right he's just yeah yeah had them all in his head yeah, definitely the 19th century stuff. You know, Freud is a contemporary yeah. with him in some sense. So yeah, it's, I guess it's, it's a little bit yeah. too relevant to be considered a classic. Um, okay, yeah, yeah. But so, yeah, so the human person is a relationship. It's a hermeneutical relationship, a transcendental relationship and how we reflect ourselves. Mm-hmm. And even the things in the world have a relationship that he calls the identity mm-hmm. relationship. So A equals A. So like a tree is just a tree. Yeah. And and the whatever the the appearance of the tree 
the being of the tree is just a pure identical relationship. And that's how it's so stable in its appearance where humans are always um, reinventing themselves, reimagining themselves, changing based on the, mm -hmm. the relationships they, they come encounter with. Mm -hmm. And God is stable as stable, I guess, as a tree, but because he's more complex, he has a middle term essentially to stabilize himself where humans okay. are only self and ego and they're searching for that middle term. Mm -hmm. so there's so yeah there's no yeah. substance in young it's it's relation all the way down yeah interesting um yeah so um okay so we've we've talked about is about revelation ontology uh justification i don't have my list i don't know if, did i miss something um in the context of all of what would what else would you add uh, to his theology that I think are would be important to reading him if I pick picked up a book today of Young and start reading him what what is important to to know before I do that yeah I I think um let me let me say two things sure. one and we mentioned this at the beginning is the particular historical context of the theologian. Mm -hmm. um, since theology is founded by this experience with God, the theologian is the one having this experience. You oh. can't do theology without faith. Mm -hmm. And this is crucial. Faith for Jungle, though, isn't like belief versus reason. Faith sure. is an ontological term. So in how does he faith, relate that to atheism? Yeah. Yeah. In faith, we it. still think and we still. Mm -hmm. um, so so it isn't we become just like dogmatic or something at that point. Sure. And in fact, a lot of one of the criticisms of Young's work is that he's too philosophical, even though he claims mm -hmm. to be doing dogmatic theology. Um, he deals too much with philosophy is what people say, uh, because okay. he wants to think through stuff instead of just assuming that we know this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the only assumption really he has is that revelation is the beginning and end of all theology. Mm. Um, so, so, so in that, the specific, the, the situation of the theologian is important. And from that position, like history isn't ignored. So right, he's careful that we're not, we're not experiencing the address of God on the cross today. Because it's 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 it has happened. God has died for the world, and that past tense is important for Jungle. But he says that what we experience is an address of God, which reveals to us the significance of the cross. So when when we come to faith, when we have that moment where we realize who God is and what He is for us, we are having. We are experiencing the same significance as happened on the cross. Our world is being interrupted just as the entire world was um, when Jesus died on the cross, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So the goal of theology and of preaching is to present the word mm -hmm. so it has that effect on people. Um, this goes back to his hermeneutics and language and his linguistics. Language isn't just signs that code stuff. Language is the presence of ontological realities. And unless you're doing the kind of theology that makes people stop and say, I have to rethink everything I've thought, you're not presenting God. You're just presenting Luther or Calvin. You're not presenting God because God is the mm -hmm. surplus. He is necessarily more than what any theologian says, including Jungle. Mm hmm. So he's kind of a theologian for homiletics. <laughs> yeah, well, well and, you know, proclamation yeah. of the word is, is as Lutheran yeah. as it gets. And to him, proclamation Absolutely. of the word isn't just saying something about God. It's presenting God. It's making mm -hmm. God interrupt. Relationally, eventively present. Present? Through, yeah, present through, through the, the address. Preaching. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, interesting. So, so... so on that same note, um, this is the second point to that. Since the particular si historical situation of the theologian matters, Jungle's particular situation matters. And 
This is the atheism of the DDR. Um, he's focused on the death of God because of the atheism that's going on. But in focusing on that, he says that atheism is participating in the truth of God. Like God did die. And we shouldn't just slight that off. We should maybe say there's a hermeneutical issue with what people mean by God and what people mean by death. And that hermeneutical yeah, issue yeah. is solved by reflection on the cross. But it isn't that they're completely off base either. Um, yeah. So he comes down to the determination that there is truth in atheism mm -hmm. and that theology can't make the claim that unless you're saved, you have no truth or unless you're saved, you have no meaning in life. He says mm -hmm. that that the people who haven't experienced God have worldly experiences which sustain meaning and present truth to them. One of the mm -hmm. the. Um, well, he has three essentially worldly experiences that do that uh life is one so experiencing mm -hmm. birth you know um experiencing the birth of a child um experiencing moments in life that make it meaningful death is another one because in the face of death when someone dies we realize how much meaning is in a life when someone yeah. that is close to us dies it doesn't matter who you are you feel the loss and that shows there's meaning to life and the third thing is beauty. In beauty, um, in the specific instance of beauty, the specific painting or the sp specific song or the specific sunset, the whole of life becomes more meaningful. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that in terms of like a secularism debate, um, this is somewhat in line with Charles Taylor, where uh, belief is not a static term that only refers to one thing mm -hmm. um, belief can happen in, in different ways if belief means uh, accessing a deeper meaning to life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um with the the truth here that we can find in atheism or non-belief it's you know, I, I hate to say it, but they, they're living in the same world we are. <laughs> I mean, in the and there's still a relation, you know, God is everywhere present. There's still a relation there. Um, so do you think in our contemporary situation, you, you talked about earlier in the beginning that there's some difference. Um what 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 are some of the differences now? How can we apply some of the insight of, of Jungle? Um, to our situation, there may be a context of uh, dialogue with our atheist friends and family. Yeah, I think, um, <clears throat> yeah, and, and I think, yeah, it is, it is, we have to be careful not to say Jungle's atheism or the, the what Jungle, what the, the atheism that Jungle okay. was experiencing is the same. And that's the big difference. Yeah, is, yeah. Is compared to what Jungle was experiencing, we have a friendly atheism you know right where where we we are aware of people as atheists um but we're more aware because they've discussion. chosen yeah and yeah. there's a possibility a it choice. isn't enforced on us it isn't we're not yeah. forced to think about that so mm -hmm. to probably to be the most true to Yungle's method is we would think of the choice to be atheist yeah. rather than atheism itself mm-hmm um what that means why are people choosing this and and this gets you know well so then beyond that the almost problem. yeah and that almost then brings it back to the church what are, what are we doing are we yeah. preaching that event we've talked on the podcast about how the doctrine of god matters is this something that like um if we were to bring in the real acknowledge the death of God part, acknowledge the, that threat of nihilism, so to speak. Um, but then also talk about how that relates to God as in a more transcendent way. Do you think that's a good resolve or is that something we should be aiming at or how would you nuance that? Yeah. Uh, what you just said, the threat of nihilism. Um, yeah. That easily ties in the uncle because 
since God is the, what he says, the unity of life and death for the sake of life, um, we don't experience nothingness. We don't experience death. We have yeah. experiences in the face of nothingness and in the face of death because God has already okay. defeated death. God has already defeated nothingness. This is what happens on the mm -hmm. cross. Um, and in that sense, we're not then faced with existential dread. Once the, I'm talking about believers here in the church, um, mm -hmm. because we trust that God has dealt with death and nothingness and those things by taking mm -hmm. death into himself, but in his primordial election, by making it part of himself, that even when we see death, we see God. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. since, mm -hmm. since we place God in that, and we have these view, we have the experiences in view of death and nothingness and not um, experience with death and nothingness, then those experiences actually become a source of hope for us. Mm -hmm. Because in death and nothingness, there's God. So we can look into the abyss and we see light and we see hope. Mm -hmm. And it adds an extra, um, a surplus of meaning for our lives. The same surplus yeah. because that God is because he is present in those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. So uh, what book should someone start out with reading if they're going to try try to dive into to Jungle? <laughs> good luck. Um, good, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> I, I honestly, I, if someone if someone is well versed in theology of either, mm -hmm. either Bart or Boltman, um, yeah, God's being is in becoming is, is probably the best place to start. Or uh, John Webster translated um, and edited two volumes of essays from Jungle. They were published by okay. um, Bloomsbury, T.T. Clark. Um, mm -hmm. Theological essays one and two of Everhard Jungle is what they're called. Those are good. Um, his, his Webster claims that he's one of the best essayists of all times. Theological essayists. Oh, okay. Um, for so, for people so who, mm -hmm. oh, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, for people who aren't uh, well versed in Bardi and Trinitarian theology, probably the best place to start is um, uh, our David Nelson has a book, uh, Young Everhard Young Old Guide for the Perplexed. Mm, okay. Um, it's it's um. Uh, TNT Clark has this whole, whole whole series, a guide to the perplexed of these of 20th century thinkers. Um, mm -hmm. That book is a really good introduction. And Paul DeHart has a book called Beyond the Necessary that was published some time ago. But I still I find myself referencing that book again and again. Um, OK, it's it's the concepts are so clear in, in that book. It's hard. It's hard to make them more clear than what's in Beyond the Necessary. Hmm. And um, just one more notable mention, a book came out this year by Deborah Caswell, who got her degree at Aberdeen um, mm -hmm. last year and uh, called Everhard Jungle and Existence, Being Before the Cross. And in that book, she tracks the death of God theology from Luther through Hegel, through Heidegger to Jungel, and shows how Jungel resolves some of the dilemmas in the previous three thinkers, but that they're all drawing from the same logic of the cross. Mm -hmm. So, so it, it's an interesting read on Hegel and Heidegger as much as on Jungel, because okay. um, the, yep. the, the implication is they're doing theology. Well, thank you, Charles. Um, we've had a great discussion about... Eberhard Jungel, and um, go ahead and leave your comments below if you have questions or thoughts or um, or you would like to reach out, leave a comment, subscribe, tweet, retweet, whatever people do with these things. Thanks again, Charles. Yep, thank you all.